Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity again. Lord, thank you for the good singing. Thank you, Lord, so far for the good, uh, Lord, the good time of fellowship. And now, Father, it comes that time when we fellowship around the Word of God. And I plead the blood of Jesus this morning. God, I feel unworthy to even stand here behind this pulpit. But God, I know, Father, that you have a, a message from the Word of God for today. And I pray that you'd use me to deliver that message. God, I pray that this old flesh would step, step aside and God, may the sweet spirit of God move around here, around behind this pulpit and take over. Lord, help me to say nothing contrary to thy will that all would say be to the glory of God. Lord, if there's someone here that's lost today, God, please, I beg you, touch them with the spirit of conviction that they might come to know you. Help us now, God, as we realize the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter number 16. Verse number 19, Luke chapter number 16 and verse number 19. Uh, this message is a message that I, you know, that I tell you that I don't particularly enjoy preaching. But it comes because God laid it upon her heart and it's necessary. And you not hear this message preached a lot in many churches. A lot of times this message has gone by the wayside because it's not uh, politically correct and it is not Sometimes a very uplifting message, but still it is necessary in our world today. And so I bring you this and ask for the help of God and ask for your prayers. I also ask you that you give me your undivided attention while I preach this message. I ask you to remain in your seats throughout the entirety of this message and, and uh, stay with us because we want the Spirit of God to be able to work and to be able to do uh, His, uh, His work this morning. Verse number 19 of Luke chapter 16, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, uh, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, I, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And I've read, read to you this story in the New Testament of two people and how that uh, they, had, they both had destination. They both were going somewhere. The title of our message would be Rich Man, Poor Man. And uh, to this morning I want to give you just a little comparison and a little contrast between uh, this, these two men. Now this, par this uh, uh, story in the Bible is not said to be a parable. There are real names used. And uh, Dives being the rich man and Lazarus uh, being the uh, poor man. And these uh, two people in Scripture, there's no doubt that these uh, types of people existed in Jesus' day. And Jesus is given the account of this and maybe as someone that he had known. So whether you believe it to be a parable or a real story, the, that, that doesn't really matter a whole lot except this, friend. The story is still real. The story is still true. And these are two people. Now the comparison of the two is this. And I'm going to preach quickly this morning. The, the, the comparison of the two is this. We, have, we see a man named Lazarus. And we see this man that you picture in your mind laying at the gate of the rich man's house. 
He couldn't get up. He couldn't walk around. He had no earthly goods. He was the poorest of the poor. Now you imagine who that might have been. Some of them maybe you've come in contact before in your lifetime. Maybe sick and miserable and uh, uh, the poorest of the poor that had nothing. Homeless people, no doubt. This may have been a homeless man. Or he may have had family that was so poor. All they could do to support him was to take him to the gate of the rich man's house and set him there every day. That he might receive enough to get by and enough to live. So we see that he was had no earthly good. He was the poorest of the poor, and we see him physically sick because he was full of sores. He was full of sores. I don't know, maybe like Job, maybe he had skin balls, maybe whatever he had, but he was sick and full of sores, and we see that his treatment for those sores was not the greatest doctors in the land, but we see the treatment for his sores was dogs that came and licked his sores. And these dogs came, and that had a healing effect to it, and he didn't mind letting the dogs soothe him and lick his sores. Friend, you say, that's a pole. I would never let that happen. Friend, I want to tell you something. You get in the deepest of despair and you get sick, you'll be willing for anything to help to give you a little bit of relief. And so this man in his sickness, his physical illness and his disease, he let the dogs lick his sores. And that was, I believe, that's way of God's way of providing for him a little comfort in his dying days. And then we see that he had to beg for what food that he got. He begged to be fed from the crumbs from the rich man's table. See, the dogs, they got the... They got, uh, you know, what was left uh, over after the supper. They got the good food. They got that. My wife says, what do my dogs want to eat? Because I feed him. And of course I feed my dogs. She said, you feed him off the plate. And sometimes I do. But you know, my dogs had better conditions than this beggar did. The dogs that I have in my house were in far better condition than this beggar was. And all he, all he could do was he come to the gate. And as he sat at the gate, I'm sure that you know, I don't see anywhere in Scripture that this rich man was mean to him. I don't see where he had, a, where he had any grievance against him coming there. I don't see that he helped him a lot, but I don't see that he did anything but let him lay there. And he probably told one of his servants once in a while, here, take the scraps out and feed them to him so he don't starve to death and die laying at my gate. And so he'd take him out, and then again, I don't see that he was unkind to him or any such thing. But the story is that there's the beggar laying there at the rich man's got Just please send me some crumbs. Just whatever falls off on the floor. Just sweep it up and give it to me. For I'm dying and I'm hungry. Will you please help me? But he was a beggar. That was his condition. That was his plight in life. And you picture that man as he lay there, as he sat there. You picture him as being that beggar that had no, no food to eat. He had no earthly future. What future did he have? He was a beggar. He had nothing to eat. He had no good clothes to wear. He was full of sores. He had no earthly future. But also, my friend, I see that he had, when it come his time to die, he had a great death. Ed man, it come his time to die, and a heavenly escort coming, and they came, and as he died, he looked up. Here come that heavenly escort of angels. They come and escorted him into Abraham's bosom. Amen. You know what? That was a relief to the beggar. That was a relief to the beggar to, to, to be out of this life and into the presence of the Lord. And so that's what happened. We see that that is the end and the, and the way that the, the beggar went. He went and was escorted into Abraham's bosom. And when he left this world, of course, as he died and went into Abraham's bosom, there was no pomp and circumstance to his funeral. Maybe they took him and maybe they pitched him over a bank. Maybe they just dug a, a, a quick grave and buried him. I don't know what they did with him. But guess what? That didn't matter because where he was then was far better than where he was to start with. Amen. So we see that he, he died. The poor man died and became a rich man. But guess what? He was only poor in body when he was here. He was only poor in, in physical things while he was here but he knew the Lord he knew Jesus and therefore even though he looked poor physically hallelujah spiritually he was a rich man amen I may not have much in this life but thank God I'm saved in the grace of God and I have riches beyond this world amen 
I'm glad I'm saved this morning. Glad I know the Lord. Now we see the comparison of the rich man. Some give him the name of Dives. And, and uh, this man had all the things that money could buy. And I, I don't, you know, knowing particularly about that history, things were important to rich people. It was important that they have a lot of things, a lot of material things, so that people could look on them and see, man, they've got a lot of wealth. It was important to them that people see that they had the finest horses and the finest camels and the finest chariots and the, and the finest maids and the finest people to wait on them and the finest uh, food to wear and the finest clothes and it was important to them. And that is what this rich man had. That's what he had. He lived a life of ease and he lived a life of luxury. Probably he was a pretty prominent man in the community. Most likely he had... Uh, some uh, maybe some political title I don't know but he was a very rich man that had everything that this world could possibly ever offer him I don't know no, no rich people in the church this morning Amen. most of us just get by from day to day from week to week and, and get by and, and, and live substantially maybe but I don't know of any rich people that got all the world wants to offer but this man did he had everything that the world had to offer him and he had it all at his disposal and all at his fingertips was right there. All he had to do was say, bring me some food and the finest dishes were brought to his table. All he had to, uh, had to do was uh, say, bring me some uh, something to drink and the finest drinks was brought to his table. He didn't have to get ahead. He had no want for anything. Never had to worry about feed for his animals. Never had to worry about you know, uh, 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 light for his house, nothing, water, nothing did he ever have to worry about. This was a rich man. And he said he fared sumptuously every day. He dressed in purple, the, the color of royalty. He dressed in purple and had the finest linens. Now, can you see this rich man? Can you picture him in your mind? And can you picture this lost or this uh, beggar in your mind? Can you see that this morning that he's also... Uh, the rich man seemed to be physically in good health. But if he wasn't, he had the best doctors at his disposal to come and help him if he got sick. What did Lazarus had? He had no doctors because the dogs come and licked his sores. And then we see that he seemed in life to have, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the beggar that didn't have no future, he seemed to have in front of him life and all that the future had to offer, the best things of life. He didn't know he was going to die. I'm sure the beggar expected it and was looking forward to the time when he would spend eternity with the Lord. But the rich man was not looking for anything but the day and the hour and the, and the particular moment and what was going on in the near future and was living for the day itself and whatever would be would be. And because of all that he had, he assumed that he could buy all the things that he ever wanted till he died. But he gave no thought to death. I wonder this morning if you're here saved by the grace of God, you sometimes think, well, it'd be a blessing when I get home to be with the Lord. Amen. And I get a little homesick when I get to thinking about heaven and all the goodness of God. But if you're here lost, when's the last time you thought about dying? When's the last time you thought about what's going to happen when you die? What's the last, when's the last time you thought of where will I spend eternity if I leave this life? Friend, I'm telling you something. Lazarus went to a real place as well as the, as the, the, the rich man went to another place. And both of them are real places. Both, everybody in this building this morning is going to go either where Lazarus went or you're going where the rich man went. And you have the choice today as to where you're going to go when you leave this world. Now, the, the, the rich man died, and no doubt they had a, he died unexpectedly. Like I say, probably wasn't expecting to die that day. Didn't wake up that morning and said, well, I'm going to die today, so I'm going to make preparation. So he woke, woke up that morning, did all that he ever did, and uh, he died. And, and I'm reading between the lines here. The Bible says that in hell he lifted up his eyes. There was no angel escort to take him. But if anybody escorted him to hell, it's the demons of hell. And they escorted him into hell, we'll say. And then as, as he was there, we probably see on the outside, they probably had a big funeral for him. They probably had the finest tomb to lay him in. 
They probably, people came from all over to look at him and to say how good a man he was and how much he'd accomplished in life and what good he'd done to the community. But guess what? It made no difference to the rich man then because the Bible said in hell he lifted up his eyes. Friend, I'll tell you something today. People don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to hear, but they want to hear only about the good things of the beyond. I'll tell you something, friend. Hell's just as real as heaven is. And Jesus preached more about hell than he did heaven. And I'll tell you, friend, today, today we need to understand as believers that people are dying and going to hell without God. And if you're lost, you need to understand that you're going to go to hell without God and without hope except you be born again. So he was, this rich man was, uh, was remembered for his wealth and for he was remembered for all the good that he'd done, but in hell he lift up his eyes. And the Bible says that when he lift up his, his eyes in hell, that he, he lift up his eyes in torment and in flame. Now, let's see the contrast between the death of Lazarus and the death of the rich man. And I'm going to be through here in about ten minutes. We see that the death of, death of, of Lazarus was by his heavenly escort as he was escorted in to heaven. Oh my, I love the song, What a Day That Will Be, When My Jesus I Shall See. When I look upon His face, and, and, and when He saved me by His grace, when I look upon His face, and He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, what a day that will be. Friend, I, don't, I tried to sit down the other night and think about all the good things of God. I tried to think about heaven and all its worth and all that I was going to get when I got there. But you know, for studying in the book of Revelation, I understand that the first thing I'm going to do when I get there, hallelujah, is get around the throne of God and I'll get to see Jesus and thank Him and praise Him for what He's done for me and making it possible for me to get there. And we in our earthly bodies now cannot take, we in our minds cannot take, the infinite things of God and we cannot understand all that God's got for us. These finite man can't take it so we're only given a brief glimpse into the good things of God. But guess what? I'm saved by the grace of God and one day that's going to be made a reality to me whether by death or whether by the rapture. I'm going where, thank God, where the beggar went. Amen. I've told this story many times about how God escorts Save people safely with great grace to heaven. As I watched my grandma pass away, we were sitting in the room and she had been talking to me, you know, or trying to and making noises and uh, we talk about things to her that we thought she might remember and she'd laugh, you know, a little bit, smile. And we knew that she could understand us, but she couldn't speak back. But of course, we sat there for a little while and we ran out of things to say. Imagine that. And me and Mom was just sitting there, and, and a few minutes later, Mom got a, she got a look on her face of a, a big smile. I hadn't said nothing. Mama hadn't said nothing. I looked at Mom, and I said, that wasn't for us, Mama. That wasn't for us. You know what happened? She done looked in on the other side. There was no coming back after that point. Hey, man, she done, I, hey, I don't care what you hear this bunch of people say. They went to heaven and come back. They didn't do it. Something wrong with that picture, friend. Something bad wrong with it. I've never heard one of them yet testify of the good things of the Lord when they got to heaven and came back. No, sir, that's a bunch of fools. Just you leave it alone. Time back in. Amen. But me and Mama sat there and we looked at her. She took a few more breaths and she went into the presence of the Lord. You just about could feel the angels and the escort that she had by grace when grace filled that room and Grandma went out. Amen. The nurse came in there, oh, oh, and, and expected us to be all tore up and bent out of shape. And of course I was sorry, and my mama was sorry for the loss of mama and grandma. But you know what? The grace of God come in that room, and we sat around there for a minute. Here come the nurse. Do we need to get the chaplain? What can we do for you? Why, how can we help you? What do you need? Do you need to see the chaplain? Mama looked at him. No, we don't need no chaplain. Couldn't understand that. You know why? Because of the grace of God and because God's people, when they die, they die well. And the people of the saved people of God's family, when they die, they get through it all right too. Amen. Sure there's sorrow. Sure there's loss. Sure there's pain. But guess what? God's grace is sufficient for you in that dying time. Amen. I've also heard stories lost people that died without God. 
Now, I've never sat around somebody's bed when they were lost and knowing they were lost and, and seen them die. Never, never done that. But I've had people tell me of the awful pain and agony that they went through before they died and how that the doctors would have to shoot them up with all kinds of pain medications, which I know saved people sometimes have to have that, and I'm not, I'm not, but that was all the relief they could get in their dying day. They had not the grace of God, but they had all that the doctors could do for them in easing their pain of death. And even at that, when they died, I've heard them tell of stories of men saying, Oh, oh, get me out of this fire. Don't let me feet burn in this fire. Pull me out of this fire. And friend, it's because they were not dying well, they were not dying with the grace of God, but they were dying and going to hell without God. And friend, I'm telling you today, because of the word of God, not because of what I say, not because of what you say, but because of the word of God, I'm telling you, people that die without God in hell, they'll lift up their eyes. Oh, God help us. Oh, God help us. We see that death of Lazarus, where they died with a heavenly escort, his death was a relief of leaving this world into the presence of God. We see that he died with nothing, but he gained everything. Heaven, it's all his wonder. It's a real place for eternity. So this beggar that had nothing when he died... But when he woke up on the other side, amen, in Abraham's bosom, he had everything for all eternity. It was his. Still is, by the way. Amen. Now we see the death of the rich man. No doubt it was a death that comes suddenly. And his death come upon him just like it is with you or I. We don't know when it's going to come time. And we're one heartbeat away from eternity, friend. Put your hand on your heart or on your wrist and feel your, feel your pulse are going. You listen, one day that's going to quit and you're going to go to be in the presence of the Lord or you're going to hell without God and there's nothing you can do about it after that point in time. It'll be too late. But I'm telling you, as long as your hearts are beating, as long as you're breathing God's hair, if you're lost without God, there is a possibility, amen, of you getting saved and going to heaven. The Bible still says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt shall be saved as it is appointed unto man once to die but after this the judgment and friend when you die without God you die without hope and this rich man died of a sudden death no doubt it was a sudden death and it was a death of agony because the Bible says in hell he lift up his eyes it does not say that he anything good happened it said he was, he was dead and buried and in hell he lift up his eyes. Hell is a real place. It's a real place of torment in verse number 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. And seeing eight, seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Number one is a place of torment because of the terrible fire and the terrible flame. And the terrible thirst and the terrible agony. But it's also a place of torment because he could look over the other side. That great gulf fix. And he could see Lazarus over there. That he begged at his table. And that he begged for what he had. And he saw him living in plenty and see, see him. Saw him living in abundance for eternity. While he realized that he himself was where he was and there he'd be for eternity. He died in agony. He died in a place of torment. He died in a place of fire. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But I'll tell you something, friend. Just as sure as the Bible tells us hell's real, I'm telling you this morning, hell is real. Amen. Don't make it some mystical thing where, I, listen, I know of a prominent, bat, or a prominent preacher that said this one time, he said, I'm not sure if, Listen, he said, I'm not sure if the fire of hell is real or, or if it's just a, a desire for God that will never be quenched. I'm going to tell you something. He's wrong. Hey, man, he's dead wrong because I tell you something. The Bible declares that there's fire in hell. If you've ever been burnt with a match, if you've ever had anything burn you and you felt the pain of that, listen, how, would, how are you going to like it when you go to hell without God? And that's an eternity of that pain and agony where you'll die and never die. State of death but never dying. The pain and agony but never no relief. The thirst but not a drop of water. He begged that the beggar, Lazarus, would dip his finger in water 
and put one drop of water on his tongue to cool that tongue, to quench that flame. But you know what? What wasn't, wasn't going to happen. It was not possible for that to happen. Why? Because eternity was what? He had chosen. And once you're in heaven, you, you won't want to get out to start with you could, if you didn't want to. But in hell, you want to get out, but you never can. There's no such thing as purgatory. There's no such thing as just drifting around till judgment day, friend. You'll, you'll be like, if you're lost without God, you're going to be just like the rich man. And I'll tell you, you'll, your heart will quit beating. You'll breathe your last breath. And in hell, you lift up your eyes. Who wants to do that? Anybody in here want to lift up your eyes in hell? Anybody want to volunteer that as a yes this morning? Why, of course not. You don't. How many of you want to go to heaven? I ask you that. Everybody's going to raise their hand. Everybody raise your hand if you want to go to heaven. Hey, man. But oh, my friend, today the truth of the matter is many people want to go there, but many people, many millions of people will not do what is required to get to heaven. And you say, what is that, preacher? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But, but preacher, if I get saved, I'm going to have to give up a lot in this life. Hey, I want to tell you something. What is it worth to you to gain the world and lose your soul? That's what the rich man did. He gained the world, but he lost his soul. Oh, my friend today, what's it worth to you? Is it worth having all the money in the world and still going to hell for all eternity? You might live to be 70 or 80 years old. You might even live to be 90. You could live to be 100 years old, lost to that God. But I'll tell you something, 100 years with the things of this life and all the things of this life without God, is it worth it to spend eternity in heaven for billions and billions and billions of years without hope and without a God in eternity in hell? Is it worth that one? hundred years? Is it worth your time on this earth to enjoy you know the, the finer things of life or had you rather have what Jesus has got for you on the other side if you just put your trust in him? Friend, where will you go when you leave this world? Oh friend I can only imagine the screams crying out from hell and guess what? On top of all of that the Bible says in the book of the Revelation says this that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. A place worse than hell is the lake of fire. The preacher, would God do that? No, God won't do that to you. God, God don't send people to hell. People make their own choice. He gives you a way out. He gives you a way of escape. And if you go to hell, it'll be, it won't be because of God, my friend. It'll be because of you, because you're too stubborn and because you're too prideful and because you was too worried about what everyone would think to give your heart to the Lord. Amen. But you give your heart to Jesus, friend, and you'll spend eternity with him. But if you don't, you'll die in your pride. You'll die in your arrogance. And you'll die in defeat because you'll go to hell without God. Oh, God help us. Christian people, get a, get a grip on this this morning. Get a good hold on this and understand that there's people going to hell that work with you, that people are going to hell that, that live beside you. And if you don't get them the message, who is? But preacher, it's, it's modern days. And we don't need to tell people where they're going. We need to t preach to them that there's love and that there's goodness in God. Sure, there's all of that. But God's also a God of judgment. And he's a God that lets you do exactly what you want to do when he can. Hey, he, your chance is this morning. Now God don't lay this message on our heart much, but it's been heavy on me this week and, and to warn people and tell you of the danger of dying without God. Where will you lift up your eyes when you leave this world? Where will you lift up your eyes? The book of Mark, chapter number 9, verse number 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter hold into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. 
I can read on and on to you the description of what's going to be for you in hell, where the fire is not quenched, where the, where the flames die not, where the worms die not, and the fire is not quenched, and where the agony and pain will be there for eternity. Well, are you going to go there today, or is the day you're going to say, I don't want to go to hell. No matter what, I don't want to go to hell. Friend, I wouldn't go to hell for anybody. I wouldn't go to hell for any reason. I wouldn't go to hell because of my pride. I wouldn't go to hell because of my religion. I wouldn't go to hell because of mom or dad. I wouldn't go to hell because of my kids. I wouldn't go to hell because of what somebody's thinking about me. Friend, I'd want to go to heaven and say, oh, I want to junk all of this and I want God in my life. Friend, I'll tell you, if you'll do that, things will be much better in your life from here on out. What's worth going to hell over? Is there anything you can think of that is worth spending eternity in hell for? Anything. Anything. And the devil will give you all kinds of reasons because of what people will think. Because of what religion will say about you. Listen, my own daughter, 14 years old, come out of the, me preaching. I may have been preaching this message. I don't remember what I was preaching. But she, she made a profession when she was young and when she was 14 years old. She got up, she'd been singing with a young, uh, with a young group of kids and, and uh, doing, a, doing a great thing in church. And she, when I was preaching the message, she got under conviction. 14 years old, she stuck out of, that, stuck out of them pew right back there and hit this altar saying she was lost and wanted to get saved. And guess what? God saved her by his grace. Amen. She, even though she was the preacher's daughter, she said it ain't worth going to hell over. It ain't worth that and I'm going to get saved. And she got born into the family of God. Amen. No matter, she was a member of the church too, by the way. No matter what it is, friend, the Bible still says you must be born again. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. Lord, I pray, God, you'd send conviction. Touch hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.